Good morning, homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. I am making uh, one of my summer staples that I make every year, which is a Niçois salad. Uh, I think I'm saying that right, it's French. Um, and this is a classic salad of potatoes, green beans, and ripe tomatoes. So it's a perfect summer dish when you've got lots of ripe tomatoes coming on and lots of green beans. Um, and this one is, um, I believe it's a Kenji Lopez Alt recipe from Serious Eats, and he calls it deconstructed. Um, so it's a little different in terms of how it's presented and how it's cooked, but it is an excellent recipe. And um, yeah, it's a great way to use green beans. So what we're gonna do here is cook both the green beans and the potatoes. My green bean harvest has not been great this year. This is all I have to show for probably over a week's worth of picking. Um, I really put the green beans in the wrong spot. Um, they are on the, in a, they're south of a bunch of squash, um, summer squash, and unfortunately the summer squash are overshadowing um, the green beans. And so I keep trimming the squash back, but it's not really enough. Um, you know what, I'm gonna get these potatoes going and then I will trim the green beans while the potatoes are cooking. So this cooking of the potatoes, they are heavily seasoned in the cooking water, which is something a lot of us don't think to do. And it's a really good idea. Potatoes are like sponges. They really suck up um, flavorings and they really need salt. And so if you don't use enough salt um, when you're cooking them, they're never really gonna I mean, it's hard to add enough salt outside um, once they're done to really make them taste good. Um, although, eh, and honestly, all potatoes taste good regardless. But, um, so there's a lot of salt in the cooking water. And then he also adds 
some garlic and a half an onion. Um, and so you're basically kind of poaching the potatoes in a, a really light vegetable stock, which is a great idea. Um, my onions are just starting to come in. This is still a store-bought onion, but I do have onions that are just starting to get harvested. I wanted to use these store-bought ones up before I start using a lot of my own, and they will hold. They're still out in the in the garden. I try to grow enough onions every year to last us the whole year. And um, for me, I figure a rough estimate is two onions a week, um, which is under, in a lot of cases, what we'll use in a week sometimes, but also over what we'll use in a week in other times. Um, and I, so I try to grow a hundred storage onions every year. Uh, on this garlic, I'm just gonna, we're just flavoring the water here. Um, and then I usually have a period from about April um, until about now, so mid-July to early August, where I don't have a lot of my own onions. Um, I do grow some green onions to try to supplement, and then I'll buy um, small amounts of the local Walla Walla sweet onions to uh, tide me over in that window when my onions are either gone or they're sprouted and they're not really great anymore. These are my own homegrown potatoes. Um, and this, I'll put the variety on the screen. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It is a russet. Um, the res recipe originally calls for Yukon Golds or other waxy potatoes. Waxy potatoes tend to be, they do better boiled. Um, russet potatoes do better baked. Um, however, this is what I happen to have. This was a recent harvest, um, and they're going to be fine. I'm not worried about it. Um, I'll just make sure that I don't overcook them. Uh, and I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm, there was a little bit of green because these were really close to the surface, and I am just peeling off the green. You may have seen, um, uh, social media things or whatever that um, eating green potatoes is toxic and it will kill you and you should never ever do it. That has been debunked, but debunked. There is some toxicity in that green, but it's not in a volume that would actually have a huge impact on you. And if you cut it off, most of it is gone. So assume that your body is capable of dealing with um, that little bit of toxicity and don't throw your green potatoes out. I, if they're like the entire potato is super green, I maybe wouldn't use it. But when it's just a little bit here and there, like these had, I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, and I've been doing that for years. This potato is a different variety. Um, this is a, called a pinto. Um, and they are more of a waxy potato. And I happened to be out in my big garden. I had some of these that I missed last year and they grew, um, I had volunteer potatoes coming up. I wasn't sure which variety they were. And I was pulling weeds and I accidentally pulled this one up. Um, they will get bigger than this, but it is one of my favorite potatoes. I just love the way it looks. Um, so I know I have some sec a secret stash of pintos out there as well. Um, so we have three quarters of a pound of potatoes. Um, for the bigger ones, I've cut them in half so that they cook faster, um, but I'm not going to cut them any more than that. I want them, he wants them to be kind of chunky. Um, Honestly, that's probably more water than we really need. I'm gonna pour some of that out. Since I haven't put any salt in here yet. Okay. So four cloves of garlic. I just did three because they were really big cloves. Um, a half an onion, three quarters of a pound of potatoes. And he calls for a half cup of kosher salt. Um, I'm gonna use a quarter cup of regular canning salt. Um, just because this is a lot cheaper than kosher salt, and I really don't think I need to use kosher salt in something that's just flavoring the water. Um, again, I've mentioned this in other videos, but kosher salt is a lot more coarse, and so um, you don't need nearly as much if you're using regular salt. And I'm just gonna stir that around until that salt dissolves. The water in the pot is already slightly warm. All right, and we will get that going. This recipe also calls for two sprigs of fresh thyme. Um, I do have some fresh thyme, but I'm in the middle of making this and I really don't wanna go outside and get it. So I'm just gonna put some dried thyme in there. 
Um, generally, the rule of thumb is about half as much dried time as fresh. Um, when you're calling for sprigs, it's hard to know how much time that is anyway. So I'm just putting a pinch in there and calling it good. I'm gonna bring this to just, just starting to boil and then we'll start timing. Meanwhile, let's trim up our green beans. I have three different varieties of green beans here. Um, provider, which I've been growing for years, it's a great bush green bean. Um, and some of these are gonna be a little worse for wear because they were picked quite a while ago, which is part of why I'm making this recipe today, even though I don't have quite enough green beans because I really can't wait any longer. These green beans need to be used. Um, but provider, which is a really nice productive uh, bush bean. And then I have Maxabelle from Johnny's and then Dragon Tongue, which are these Romesco style beans that are flat. Um, they're very popular with the heirloom vegetable crowd. So if I was smart, I would have lined all of these up stem in first and my life would be faster. But it's Friday and I have had a nice week and I'm not in a giant hurry, so not gonna worry about it too much. That one we lost the top on. Most of these are provider. Um, they got the best germination uh, and then the other varieties. I ended up replanting um, my green beans and so some of them, the Maxibels are behind and so they're not quite there yet. Not to mention all the shade. I'm gonna leave these long. I'm not gonna cut them beyond this. Um, I am one of those people that loves to eat things with my fingers. I think it makes things taste better. I'm weird, I don't know. Um, but I love eating long things with my fingers. Asparagus is another great example. Um, I just think it tastes so much better when you eat it with your fingers. And um, so I prefer my green beans to be long. Um, so that I can pick them up and eat them with my fingers. Um, you do you. If you're not somebody who likes to eat with their hands, maybe cutting these into more um, fork-sized pieces would be appropriate. Okay. For this, we're just gonna uh, blanch these green beans um, he says salt well. There's a lot of good chefs out there who say that your watch water for vegetables should be as salty as the ocean. I think that's an exaggeration. The ocean is about three to three and a half percent salt. That is a lot of salt. Um, but it is a good reminder that we tend to undersalt our vegetables and it really, part of the reason why a restaurant vegetable will taste so much better um, is just simply that they seasoned the water well when they cooked it. Um, they also tend to use a lot of fat and fat is flavor and so there's that as well, but oops, I obviously lost a couple here. My chickens have been very much enjoying all of the great compost lately. We've been doing a lot of fruit production and so they've been getting lots and lots of extra fruit. Um, I have a video about processing um, apricots and in that I show them throwing throwing a big compost bucket of apricots to them that were bad <clears throat> and they are very very happy the other thing we can do here is make our vinaigrette while I'm waiting for the water to come to a boil and for that I needed a small clove of garlic this is my this year's garlic that I haven't had a chance to clean um, and I sell a lot of garlic and so the really good heads get sold and then the, what I call the scratch and dent um, I use or I dry. Okay, that is not the one we wanted. Um, and so they're still drying in the greenhouse. I haven't cleaned anything up yet, um, but this is the, this is this year's harvest. There's something about having a greenhouse full of garlic that makes you feel incredibly rich. Because these aren't fully cured, they're really hard to peel because they're super fresh. Okay, 
So for the vinaigrette, I need garlic. I need a shallot. These are also this year's shallots from the garden. Shallots are hard to peel. And so I find that splitting them in half first and then taking off that outer layer is a lot more effective. And then because I'm probably just gonna dice this, I'm just gonna take the bottom off. There is a tiny bit of schmutz there on this particular one, which is probably why it came up so easily when I was weeding. Okay, so our bean water is boiling. In these go. And I am literally just blanching these. So they are gonna be in here for three minutes. Just enough to set the color and make them tender crisp. All right, our potatoes are boiling. We wanna turn that way down so that they are just barely simmering. We don't wanna bang them around and make them fall apart. And he suggests 40 minutes. Now I'm just gonna set a timer on my phone for that. That looks perfect, just barely simmering. Meanwhile, back to dicing or mincing shallots. And you could use red onion in this instead. I would probably double the amount um, and this is for the vinaigrette, so it's going to be in the dressing. So if you do use red onions, slice them very thin, dice them very thin. I think the number one use I see for shallot is in salad dressings. It's a very popular salad dressing ingredient, especially with French cooking, which is this recipe is French, so... And I've said this in other videos, but if you've never cooked with shallots, shallots are basically as if an onion and garlic had a baby. So the shallots are stronger than an onion, not as strong as garlic. They have their own unique flavor. And again, because this is going into salad dressing, I'm really gonna mince these fine. They're pretty strong. The vinegar is gonna help temper that. That works with onions too. If you put a little vinegar on onions, it will cut a lot of that sulfur bite. Whew, these are fresh. It's making my eyes water. So our green beans are done blanching. And he suggests ice water. I've got a messy sink because my dishes in the dishwasher aren't quite clean. So what I'm gonna do is just cool these really quickly and throw some ice water, ice in that. So again, these are just tender crisp and we're setting the color. It's unfortunate that the dragon tongue beans don't maintain that great purple streaking as they cool um, or as they cook. I love how they always have you use ice water and you know immediately dunk in ice water as if, um, you know, just running cold water on the vegetables is not gonna stop the cooking. I mean, you're going from 212 degrees to 
you know, room temperature or lower in less than 30 seconds. Um, I don't think that 30 seconds is going to make a huge difference in terms of like, say you had a big bowl of ice water, maybe it would r reduce that to 15 seconds. I don't think that difference in timing is really going to make that big of a difference in whether your vegetables are overcooked or not. It's always like this big drama um, to put your uh, whatever your vegetables are in ice water immediately. So this water is feeling nice and cool now. I'm gonna put one more handful of ice in there. But you know, I, I think I think they're done cooking. As soon as colder water hits them, I'm not worried about it. All right, we're just gonna let that sit while we finish the dressing. So we have our shallots. I love using the edge of a knife to move vegetables around. That was one of those things that make me, made me feel like I actually knew how to cook when I finally started doing that. It's such a small thing, but it makes such a huge difference in terms of how things work. It's such a small thing, but I feel like it makes such a big difference in terms of how frustrating it is uh, to move vegetables around. So I am throwing in a very small clove of garlic here, but I'm also putting it through my rasp grater, which means that it's going to be stronger flavored than it would be if I just minced it or put it through a, a regular garlic press, because I've basically broken open all of those little garlic cell walls. Okay, for the rest of our dressing, we need two teaspoons of Dijon. done a lot of recipes on this channel with that have included Dijon mustard. I feel like I've said multiple times that this is homemade Dijon recipe. Uh, link in the description below. I need a tablespoon of water. That's probably just to cut the acidity slightly. Kind of an unusual ingredient for dressing. Three tablespoons of white wine vinegar. And honestly, you could use whatever you liked. I just happen to have white wine vinegar, so I am going to go ahead and use it. It's what the recipe called for, but any vinegar you like would be just fine. I imagine sherry vinegar would be lovely in this, or red wine vinegar. Maybe not balsamic, just because of the color. So anchovy. Don't be afraid of anchovies. If used correctly, it is not going to make your stuff taste fishy. It is just going to be packed with umami and a, a flavor that you can't put your finger on, but just makes everything better. So I was worried and freaked out by anchovies for a long time. And then I finally started cooking with them and was like, oh, this is not a big deal. People always make such a big deal about it. Um, this anchovy, this particular brand, um, for whatever reason, they have just disintegrated in the jar. Um, so it makes it easy because I can just fish them out this way. Um, I needed a teaspoon of that. And generally, if you're looking for this, um, if you've got kind of an ethnic section of your grocery store that has um, good quality Italian stuff, so usually in the pasta aisle, this is where you'll find that. Um, sometimes it's near like pickles and other things, but usually with the pasta. So we're gonna whisk this together. And the Dijon is in there for flavor, but it's mostly in there as an emulsifier because it's what makes the watery ingredients of the vinegar mix with the oil um, and stay mixed for a fairly good amount of time. And so mustard is a wonderful emulsifier and it's why you see it in so many dressing recipes. It's also great flavor-wise. Okay, so that's mixed. This calls for three quarters of a cup of oil. That is a lot of olive oil. Most recipes um, for salad dressing are about a quarter or one part um, watery ingredients and then about three parts um, oil. Um, so a three to one ratio. I don't tend to want my stuff quite that rich. So I'm going to start with a half a cup and see where we end up. Um, you do you. If you 
are not worried about calories, you can certainly use the full amount of oil. It will taste fantastic. I've made this a lot, this recipe, every year, and so I think I'm going to be okay with a half a cup. I'm sure I've done this before. So what I'm doing here is drizzling in this oil slowly and continuing to stir and whisk. And what that's doing is creating that emulsion. So the, the mustard is helping the oil and the vinegar mix. And it's creating little, what are called micelles, where um, the hydrophilic end and the hydrophobic end are lining up in a certain way that keeps everything suspended. There's some sciencey words for you. And this does not need any salt because those anchovies are really salty. And so that's why there's no salt in this. This is gonna be better when it sits for a bit. Those shallots are gonna be really strong right now. The garlic is gonna be really strong. Um, it'll be better after it sits for a bit. And I'm actually making this for dinner tonight and it's in the morning, so this will be nice after it's had a, a minute. Yeah, that's fine. I don't think we need more oil. All right. So our green beans are done. Our dressing is done, our potatoes are cooking. I did not weigh these. I think the recipe called for a pound and a half of green beans. I'm sure that's not actually how many I have here. But again, I couldn't wait to cook these any longer. They really needed to be used. So we might be a little heavier on the tomatoes, which I have more of, and a little slightly less heavy on the green beans. Salad dressing recipe does call for some fresh ground black pepper, which makes sense. I was kind of wondering where it was. And I don't think it needs any more salt. So you could certainly add some if you wanted to if you thought it did need it. Green beans done, dressing done. Potatoes very gently simmering. We'll come back in 24 minutes when those are finished. All right, our timer has gone off and then it suggested that we let the potatoes cool for a few minutes and I Rather than trying to drain this, I'm just gonna fish these out of here. And I can't imagine these aren't cooked all the way through. I will check them, but 40 minutes is a long time to cook potatoes. one. Oh yeah, nice and soft all the way through. No resistance. All right, so our potatoes are also done. And I'm going to just cool all of this stuff and then we will assemble this evening when we're ready for dinner. All right, we are back. It is evening and we are ready to put this salad together. I have three hard-boiled eggs here. It actually calls for four, but I'm not going to bother um, boiling another hard-boiled egg just for this recipe, so we'll be a little short on eggs. These are homegrown chicken eggs. I like to boil my eggs, um, hard-boil my eggs in my Instapot. Um, if you've got an Instapot and you've never made hard-boiled eggs in it, um, it is worth doing, especially if you have farm fresh eggs. The fresher the egg is, the harder they are to peel, and so Homestead eggs are notorious for making a huge mess and being really hard to peel. The solution to that is steaming them rather than boiling them. 
And that's basically what you do in an Instapot. And so they call it the 555 method, where you do five minutes uh, under pressure, five minutes cool down, and then uh, release the rest of the pressure, put them in the sink, and five minutes with cold water. Um, it works great. Um, and it's a really nice way to be able to do multiple eggs at once without a lot of hands-on tending. Um, I actually actually did overcook these so that there's going to be a bit of a green ring around the yolk. That's what you get when you overcook them um, because I set the Instapot and then I fell asleep. <laughs> um, I took a nap and so these are slightly overcooked which is not going to be the end of the world. Um, but yeah, great way to, to make them in an Instant Pot if you happen to have one. I have a blog post on Instapot. It was one of those things where I was, everybody, you know, was it was all the rage. Everybody was super excited about it. And I was like, God, do I really need another appliance that can do the same thing I can do in other ways? Um, but my husband, we talked about it and my husband got me one for Christmas. And I actually do use it quite a bit. I don't use it for meals very often, um, but I do use it for a lot of um, things where I'm prepping food for meals. My favorite thing to make in it is just um, steel cut oats. If you've ever made steel cut oats and had it boil over on the stove, which is pretty much every time I have ever made steel cut oats, um, the Instapot solves that problem. It was worth the purchase just because I don't have to clean boiled over steel cut oats off of my stove. Um, it's great for beans. It's really great for um, grits um, or polenta um, where you can make it really quickly and again don't have to stand there stirring something. Um, so uh, I've ended up using it quite a bit. These are garden tomatoes, early season, slightly scratch and dent. This is a Cherokee purple. And if it wasn't a Cherokee purple, I probably would have tossed it. I missed it. It's a little bit overripe, but the flavor on these is my favorite tomato. And so I'm going to cut the bad bits out and make it work because I really, really love this tomato. He says small tomatoes or cherry tomatoes. I'm going with what I've got. Um, I'm not sure what this one is. This is probably Canner Hole or Brandywine. And what you see on the bottom here, this is blossom end rot. Um, there's a lot of myths around blossom end rot. It's, it's a lack of calcium, but um, it's more than that. It is the plant's inability to move the calcium to where it's needed. And so it's not so much there isn't calcium in the soil. That may be an issue, um, but it's inconsistent watering. Um, and sometimes you just don't have any remedy for that because it's super hot, it's crazy weather, which is why these are doing this. This is a variety that does not normally get um, blossom end rot. Um, and there's um, getting a regular watering regime is helpful, although I do have that. My garden is on a drip system and everything gets deep watered every three days. Um, and then more frequently, if we're going through a really hot spell, um, we did just go through a couple of, or about a week of over hundred degree weather. Um, however, that probably, Blossom and Rod probably happened before that. Um, sometimes it's just conditions that you don't have any control over. Um, but you can use the rest of the tomato. A lot of people think that, you know, the whole tomato is lost. It's not, just cut out the bad parts and you'll be fine. Um, this really big tomato here is Anthony Bourdain's heart, or Anthony's heart, I believe is what it's called. Um, it's a very nice paste tomato, and I grow these every year, and this happens to just be an early one. I'm probably putting more tomatoes in this recipe than what it actually calls for, um, but I'm a little bit short on green beans, and so I'm going to make up for it with beautiful garden tomatoes instead. These are dead ripe. Um, some people would not think this was good, that they were too ripe. I love a good ripe tomato. doesn't bother me a bit. How is your tomato season going? It's been so hot around most of the country that I think a lot of people are having a lot of issues with tomatoes. I'm really grateful to grow tomatoes in the western U.S. where it's not super humid 
because we have issues with the heat, but we don't often have a lot of issues with disease. Um, you know, we'll get a little bit of something late in the season, but we don't have the humidity, and so we don't have big issues with blight um, for the most part, which is something I am very grateful for. Having a really nice, sharp knife is very nice for tomatoes. This is a regular knife. This is not a serrated knife, um, but I have a good knife sharpener that's really inexpensive. I'll put a link to it in the description, um, and it is worth buying ones for keeping your knife blades a little bit sharp so that you can actually cut through that tomato skin. All right, I think it calls for the hard boiled eggs being slivered lengthwise as well. Imagine because that yolk is a little overcooked that these are gonna kinda wanna fall apart. And that's all right. It's all gonna be in the mix. It's gonna be fine. Yeah, see that green line? That's from the fact that they were overly, overly cooked. I had COVID in June and I find that while I'm pretty much completely recovered, except for a little bit of phlegm still, we're now in early August, um, I still, if I sit down on the couch in the afternoons, man, I can take a nap in a heartbeat and I didn't used to be that way. So I think I had a 15 minute nap and so these were, instead of 555, it was more like 525. <laughs> Okay, and this just all gets tossed together. And so I'm just gonna toss these tomatoes in here, toss the eggs in here. I'm gonna be kind to my husband who is not the aficionado of eating everything with their fingers the way I am. I'm gonna slice these executive decision here. I'm gonna just give those a quick cut in half. So green beans in. And then on the potatoes, he suggests just kind of mashing them and then crumbling them. So that's what I'm gonna do. So they're chunky and there's lots of little crags to hold the dressing. And I do kind of like the rustic look of this too, the fact that they're not all diced perfectly, that they're chunky. I think it's a nice, that skin wants to come off, I'm just gonna let it. I mostly leave my potato skin on. I know a lot of people peel their potatoes, but a lot of the vitamin is in the skin and I like the flavor. And so unless it's got a bad spot on it, I pretty much always leave my skins on. They do come off really easily if you steam your potatoes. Actually, that's another good use for an Instapot. Um, it's very nice for steaming potatoes and then throwing them in the fridge and then they're cooked, but they're still firm enough that you can crisp them up in a pan for breakfast. Um, and I do that a lot when I have potatoes around. There's kind of a funny hard core in the middle of that one, so we're just gonna toss that bit. All right, we also need some tuna. This is not super high quality tuna. If I'd had more time, I would have, we have an Italian deli in town and they have a bit of an import um, dry goods area, I would have gone and gotten a really nice can of tuna. Um, this is, however, tuna packed in oil rather than packed in water um, because that's going to give it more flavor. You could choose to do water or oil, it's up to you, um, but a better quality tuna would have been nice in here. I just didn't happen to have it. My local grocery store does not really have much in the way of gourmet tuna. 
took me a really long time to find one that was packed in oil. Um, it's kind of non-existent anymore. I don't know about you guys, how old you are. I grew up with tuna packed in oil. That was the norm. And um, it really isn't a thing anymore. And actually, that does not look terribly oily. It looks like mostly water. Um, so even packed in oil, I don't think it's all that much oil. All right. And I'm just going to chunk this up in here. Generally, there are two kinds of tuna that you see in cans in the store, albacore, and um, it just says chunk light tuna or chunk white tuna, which I think is usually slipjack. Um, albacore tuna is better flavor-wise, but it also it tends to be higher in mercury, and so um, I don't usually buy albacore. I did for this recipe because I wanted a better flavor. Um, but it's not something I make a regular habit of. And it's just because the albacore tunas are larger. Um, they're bigger tuna. And so what happens is the, the mercury that's in the water gets into the smaller fish and then the smaller fish eat the, or the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. And it's called bioaccumulation where the bigger you are, the more of it you end up with in your system. And so that's why albacore has more mercury. Um, just because it's a bigger fish. I'm going to give that a good rinse. Oof. Just because I really don't want my sink or my hands to smell like tuna. And we have a couple of new kittens, and so I'm saving the, the tuna juice for the kittens. They're going to be very happy about that. So the actual recipe calls for eight ounces of tuna, so a bigger can. Again, not something that was available at my store, so I'm just gonna go with five ounces. Um, it calls for a couple of um, tablespoons of capers. And this caper jar, little tiny narrow, so hard to fish the capers out of here. I'm not a huge caper fan. I've learned to like them more than I used to, um, but not. it's not my favorite gourmet. I'm trying to get about a teaspoon per scoop here, and three teaspoons is a tablespoon, so. There's a few left in there. And capers are the unopened buds of I forget what the name of the plant is. And I've actually looked at whether or not it was something I could grow, because I thought it would be really fun to make my own capers or to sell capers for other people. Um, but it's not something that is that does well in my climate. So kind of a non-starter, unfortunately. Three quarters of a cup of olive. There are some fun things that you can do where you make um, basically your own version of capers, but you use things like dandelion buds. Um, I am not a big enough eater of dandelions to make that something that I find worth doing, um, but you can use foraged foods to make your own version of capers, which is a cool idea. Um, I'm just generally not a big pickled food eater, and so... I'm not gonna go out of my way to make something like that because it's not something I enjoy a lot. But if you love them, try looking that stuff up. Um, I will see, I follow a, a blog called Practical Self-Reliance. I will see if she's got a recipe for dandelion capers and put a link below if she does. All right, three quarters of a cup of good olives. These are Kalamata. We used to have a great olive deli at our grocery store, and then with COVID, they pretty much stopped doing that. And so now everything is prepackaged, and it's just not nearly as good as it used to be. Um, I am going to cut these in half. So I, the Kalamatas are about the best off-the-shelf olive that you can get. I really love a good 
buttery, fat, green olive, but I've never found them in a jar that I actually like them as well. I like them from the deli. I'm not sure what the difference is, but... It took me years to learn to like olives. I really didn't like them for a long time, and I still really detest black olives out of a can. Um, and I will, to this day, pick black olives off of a pizza. Um, I think it's just yuck. I don't know that it's the texture. There's a squeak to them and a firmness that I just find really off-putting. I am not a black olive girl. Um, green olives I can do. And Kalamatas, they're kind of a nice happy medium where they're not really squeaky, rubbery the way black olives are. more later but for now and then it says 10 to 20 basil leaves there's a principle in permaculture of setting your homestead up in circles where the things that you're going to access the most often are right next to the house and then the things that you need access to less often are further away. And I'm not always really good about setting things up that way, but I really love having fresh herbs right outside the door. I'm so much more likely to actually use them in cooking if they're right outside the door than I am if they're far away. And I have some beds that are further away and some beds that are right up next to the house. And uh, yeah, I'm much more likely to use them if they're just right outside the door. On these big leaves, I'm gonna just tear these because that's a big old bite of basil. And I'm probably not gonna use all of this in here. I have a girlfriend who can just eat basil leaves just raw out of hand and I'm not, they're really strong to me. I'm not one of those people that can do that. I do love them with a good tomato this time of year, though. It's definitely an essential summer ingredient. And I'm not cutting this because cutting it is more likely to bruise it. Um, it's going to bruise anyway, but tearing it is going to be less destructive to those cell walls than... I think that's enough. I don't want a ton in there. And this calls for everything to be tossed together. I am not going to toss the lettuce greens in because I am going to put dressing on that. And everything else in there will hold up pretty well. But these lettuce greens would just wilt very quickly. And since I know we're not going to eat all of this tonight, I'm going to leave the rest of it um, without the lettuce greens so that we can do this again tomorrow night. These beautiful lettuce greens are from Hayshaker Farm, which is a farm just up the road from me. And they do a better job of getting greens in the summer than I do. And so I grow my lettuce myself in the early part of the year. And then as it gets later and later, I, uh, I let them grow it. And then eventually they don't have it either. And I start a fall crop. But it's nice to be able to, to support another farm. This is our dressing that we made this morning. I'm just going to give this a quick whisk. Get it nicely mixed again. I'm just going to pour all of that over this. Give this a nice toss. Make sure everything is distributed. As soon as that dressing hits those tomatoes, they're gonna start releasing juice. So it's gonna get juicy real fast here.
All right, and I don't want to do this too much because I'm going to destroy those eggs if I mix this too much. So I think we're going to call that good. green beans on that one. This did call for actual anchovies on the salad as well. I am choosing to leave those out. Um, I think just anchovies in the dressing is going to be more than enough for what I need. All right. Sorry, it's hard to not keep fiddling with it. Just a tiny bit of salt. That's Redmond's real salt. And there you go. Niçois salad for dinner. One of the best fresh eating summer salads you can make. Enjoy. <laughs>